This is Quorum Deo Conversations, where we have conversations about everyday life and connect it ultimately back to theology or who God is. So today I have Madison with me. Hey, Madison. Hello. Much appreciated. Well, yeah, definitely. How about you uh, just introduce yourself, tell the people, tell people about yourself? Well, as stated, my name is Madison, Madison McCowan. I'm about 23 years old, edging on 24, out here in the very dry desert of Arizona. Um, recent graduate of Lambda School. Lambda School is an online tech school where they can teach code development and iOS and computer science and different very mainstream bleeding edge technologies into technology careers. Um, I mean, other than that, I'm a good friend of Alex. Alex is a good friend of mine, and I went to his Bible study a few years ago, or started going to his Bible study a few years ago, where we became friends, and it just took off from there. Yeah, it's been sweet. So, sweet, awesome. What What is the topic we're going to go through today? Today is all about coding and theology. My line of work or my career as of right now, I'm a junior full stack web developer. So talking all about this will be fun and kind of retrospect to look back on in a few years. Be like, hey, that's what I knew then. That's how I applied it then. And then this is what I think now. So Yeah. Coding theology, definitely a, a fun correlation to make. Um, at surface level, one could kind of see the intrigue, but then unless you really know things about it, it's kind of hard to reach for examples. Right. Yeah. And we'll definitely open those up for sure. So what, like, what got you into coding? What do you enjoy about it? So when I first started, I was actually working at, um, <clears throat> Sorry, I was actually working at Home Depot and I was kind of doing it on the side just because I liked computers and technology and I liked being able to go in and edit things. And it was, it was actually kind of funny. I would go into um, the software that they had for the paint department to use, um, things that they weren't expecting employees to know how to necessarily get into and I would change different fonts and backgrounds for the different paint computers um, every other week. So one day the Home Depot official UI would be purple instead of orange. So <laughs> I would change just fun stuff like that. But I was actually doing a, um, a small do-it-yourself camp on the side called uh, Team Treehouse. And they had all the all the code and videos and instructions there on the website, but it was a very go at your own pace. And since it was something that I really wanted to make a career of because I liked the idea of being so creative on screen and being able to manipulate things and create things. Um, and I'd, I had been a big gamer and delved with some gaming code from time to time. <clears throat> excuse me, um, I thought that would be a great avenue for me to pursue. And it would be, you know, obviously way better than working in retail. It's a, it's a very lucrative market, but I thought if I'm going to start a family in the future, I want something that's going to be pretty secure. And that's something that I really love doing. So I was looking for different avenues to do that. So from Team Treehouse, I got the idea of just how much involvement I was going to need to have in it and um, like the the effort and the full-time necessary requirement to be able to do it. So I was looking for different avenues such as like coding camps, boot camps, colleges. Um, I've always said and me and my fiance have joked about this a lot is like if I was to go to a college I'd never get anything done. I'd always get too distracted because um, I like doing a lot of different things, but sometimes pretty lights can come come around. I'll be like, oh, pretty light. Wait, what was I doing? Yeah. 
So I was looking for something that was more full-time, more um, just really to the point, no, no fat about it, just really what I wanted to know, which was how to code, how to create a career like that. And so Lambda School was something that uh, my dad actually first found and he showed that to me and then I went and researched that. And the, the research that I had accumulated from that basically showed that Lambda School offered up to a nine month plus program to learn full stack web development, which full stack means a term to uh, completely envelop the front end of development and back end side of development. Okay. Um, and as I was looking into that, most other boot camps and uh, really majority of boot camps, like 99% boot camps other than the exception of Lambda, um, are very money up front. It's like three to four months and then that's it, mm -hmm. right? You, you can, of course, outreach through connections that you made at that college or whatnot. And most of those boot camps come from a singular college curriculum. Um, I'm hard pressed to remember the name, but out of that curriculum, you know, I, f I figured I was going to get more out of the nine months of full time than I would the three months, obviously just the time wise. And, uh, what really got me was their, um, their schooling structure. It, what you do is with Lambda is you sign, sign an income share agreement, basically saying if you make so much after um, you go through Lambda's program, you pay a certain percentage for two years, and then that's it. But there's no money up front to get into Lambda. And that was the biggest thing, you know, working a minimum wage retail job is just not a lot of money. You can really save up from that as well as paying rent and stuff. Um, so that, that was the best option. And going through it, it really in retrospect, just thinking back through it, it really was the best option. Um, I took some breaks within mm -hmm. Lambda because they allowed certain breaks to be made. Of course, a break to revisit some curriculum that I could go back and refine and that would give me time to also just ease off the constant learning, 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 learning. Because um, it was a lot to learn. It was probably the most yeah. academically challenging thing I have ever done. Um, I had never done school for, um, and this is just me personally, I know there are, there are things that could be considered more challenging, but it doesn't downplay that. Uh, I went through school for a solid year and I had never done that up to that point. Even homeschooling when I would do, um, when I would do uh, school throughout the summer and stuff, you know, there was always like, breaks or there were months in between or like you'd take a class for a month and then that'd be your summer course but this was from april 2019 to april 2020 that was a solid year of just constantly learning every week every day was something new so uh -huh. it was really fun i really enjoyed it um and i definitely learned a lot you know the ability to like set up a basic website in you know an hour you know, it's not going to look pretty, but I could have a database, a front end, back end, a login set up in that amount of time. And it's, it's, it's really cool to know that stuff. It's really cool to then go online and see how other um, websites are developed and tools are used like that. Um, cool. something, something they taught was not just the ability to code. And I mean, I guess we can get into that. Uh, a little bit later, but the mentalities of how to start a career like that, the three things that you'd really need, or two really big things that you need to learn as a developer is the languages, how languages work, like what the workflow of language is, because when you learn one, as I'm told, and really as I've seen from learning JavaScript and Python, when you understand a language, you can then understand the structure of how languages work and move to the next language and go, excuse me, and go, how do I get A to B in this language, mm -hmm. right? Like I know what's possible now, how do I write that in their grammar or in their uh, syntax? And then the other thing is actually what a lot of uh, the work was as well is searching, Google searching, <laughs> mm -hmm. documentation. 
Um, it's about 50-50. In fact, it's actually more like 60-40, where it's 60% researching and reading documentation and learning how to Google things and how to properly um, seek out documentation and then 40% actually coding uh, that, that documentation. What do you mean by searching out documentation? Like you have to learn how things work from other coders or? Um, not necessarily like that. There is, there is, um, there are sites that people will have specific problems and they'll be like, how do I do this with this problem? And other people will get on the forum and be like, oh, you just do this or you just do this. Um, but something you learn real quickly is that there's about a hundred different ways to solve one problem and about a billion different ways to write those hundred different ways to solve that problem. Mm. So um, documentation is the the more um, trying to describe other than just like it's what describes what the function does. So if I say I want to write a function that returns something and that function needs to use a method that does that or a method that does math or there's a there's a method called math that allows you to use math things in um, that function. I'd go into the documentation of JavaScript or React or whatever um, library or framework I'm using and see what all that math, um, what all that math can do. So things for sorting, things for um, reiterating, things for sectioning things out. Um, documentation is really just describing what each aspect of a framework or function can do. Okay. There's, so it's like trying to figure out what tools you have to start building and how right. and what methods you're going to use to do that. Right. Um, think of it also like you have a hammer, right? There's a lot of things you can do with a hammer. And so the documentation is a big long description about everything that you can do with the hammer. It's okay. not absolutely everything. There are ways you can engine, you can just be creative and go, because it has this kind of result, I can use a hammer to technically ski down a mountain. You know, it's a random example, but sometimes code is just kind of like that. Okay. That sounds completely out of my world. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and that's kind of what coding is, right? It, I mean, one, it's this whole new language, and it seems like, yeah, you have to really go through something quite immersive and quite intensive to, to really grasp it well. I mean, I tried Code, code Academy for a while, and I got a little far, but, but unless you're, like, really diligent with it and enjoy it, I think it has to be quite immersive, um, but yeah, and, so it's that, go ahead. Uh, and that's what I was going to say is what I liked about Lambda so much is because my example earlier where sometimes I can get um, sidetracked trying to find what I really want. Um, Lambda was a 40 hour a week school, 40 plus hour a week school. Sometimes I was spending way more than, you know, eight hours a day trying to research topics and actually do the, um, the coding homework as it were. But um, really in depth, you're in an environment where you have a, a team leader who's in charge of a group of six to eight students. You report to them every day. You have stand up every day to be like, hey, how's your day? Let's go over the problems. Where'd you get stuck on? You know, you have a several hour lecture in the morning with a, with a um, career professional. Oh, excuse me. Um, and it really was if you if I didn't have the professionals there, if I didn't have the team lead there, other people to ask questions, you're I wouldn't really have learned as much as I have. The biggest thing is constantly ask questions. No, you, there's no point in a developer's life where you get to a sec where you get to a point that you're like, okay, now I know everything. 
web development and um, languages themselves are constantly changing and evolving. Even when I first started uh, going through JavaScript and the front end side of React and uh, Redux, that changed. Yeah, I would go back to my, I would go back to the earlier curriculum and, you know, six months down the line that had changed six months later because React had updated. React had moved forward and there were new things going on that they were teaching newer and newer students. So it's, it's a constant learning curve uh, to be in the mindset that not everyone knows all the answers all the time. You're not going to know the answers all the time, but you need to learn the tools on how to find out those answers how to ask those right questions, who to go to for those questions. Um, so that's something I really enjoyed about Lambda. Yeah, yeah, and, and just the aspect that it changes all the time, is that something that discourages you or is that something that like really drives you on? Uh, it, um, really do, it, it really does drive me on. Um, in the coding community, there's, and I guess outside the coding community, but there's a thing called imposter syndrome where you get stuck and you just start to think to yourself. It's more of like doubting syndrome is really what I would call it, self-doubt, where you start to doubt yourself on, um, you don't think your code's good enough, you don't think you're able to figure it out, you think things may be moving too fast, um, you think all these different negative things and the reason a lot of people call it imposter syndrome imposter syndrome um, is because it's kind of the idea that you're not who you think you are in that you're you're thinking about an imposter you are better than this you're able to do it um, and there were certainly times in lambda where um, days would go by that I was like did I really learn anything I don't know if I'm able to complete this next sprint because I'm not sure if I actually learned what I think I'm supposed to have learned. Mm -hmm. um, and there were days that I uh, that I had to willing that I willingly decided I need to go back and redo that. If I if I took the sprint now, which the sprint was the test at the end of the week, every Friday, we would go through curriculum Monday through Thursday. Monday is basics, Tuesday's advanced, uh, Wednesday is in depth on the advanced and Thursday is stuff that we will mostly cover next week. Then Friday is the sprint or uh, the test rather that we take that's about three hours you go through take a sprint test and then if you pass that you move on to the next week. So there were definitely times that I had gotten to the sprint and I was like uh, if I really think hard about it, I could probably pass it, but I don't know. I don't have confidence that I really know what I know. So I need to go back, retake it, and then go through it. Mm. So um, it's, it's kind of a, you need to constantly be aware of that so you're not constantly letting yourself down. Mm. Um, you need to be aware of what the environment is like so you're not setting your standards too high and then you're constantly not able to meet them and you're constantly getting depressed because of that. Um, yeah. it, is, it is just a, a mindset to be aware of. Yeah. So, okay, maybe let's take a step back to, to what coding actually is, just for the ordinary person. And, mm -hmm. and if someone wants to start that as well, like what are the steps to just begin? Can you start coding, you know, in a really simple way and, and it builds or, you know, what is coding and then what does it look like to start moving forward in it? So coding at the top level, like the most basic way I could explain this to someone, um, and then I'll explain something else about it, is it's a language written that mediates between human languages and computer languages. At the base level, when I say computer language, I really mean the ones and zeros. At the base level, that's what the computer's reading. It's reading ones and zeros, things like binary. It's reading it at a very, very detailed low level. 
And what we're able to not necessarily perceive, but use our coding languages that translate for us what the computer should be doing. Okay. So it's it's a language for us, made for us, to help write and understand and tell what the computer or whatever we're working on to do. So in in that regard, it's it's really like learning. Ooh, you know, they are called languages because they really do act like other native languages and like English, Spanish, um, German, Japan, Japanese, sorry, Japan's not a language. Um, it's really just for them to be able to translate on screen what's happening so the computer can run it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, does that, like, that kind of make sense? Yeah, no, it totally does. Okay. And I mean, I know there's a, a lot of different types like Python, Java, Script, and CSS, HTML. You know all those those ones, the general. Actually, all four of those are the primary ones I learned. Okay. <laughs> um, Have yeah. You kind so... of branched yeah. out. Have you branched out of those ones? Because you have to kind of learn some more if you want to do specific work, right? Some. Um, when getting into the actual tech career, you're never, when going through a boot camp and then getting into the actual tech career, you're never going to only be working with what you learned in boot camp. And that's why the, men the best mentality to come out of a boot camp is did you learn a language and did you learn how to research? Because if you know how to research, you can go out because you already know a language. You know how languages work. You can then research how other languages work and start learning other ones. Mm -hmm. um, so like the difference between JavaScript and Python, Python's more considered the, the Swiss Army knife of coding. Um, it's, it's good at a lot of different things. Um, I primarily used it during the course through computer science, so advanced algorithms, graph, um, you know, blockchain, link lists, different things like that. Um, so I use Python or I'm used to Python through more of the back end side, but you can do other things with it. JavaScript, you have both a front end and a back end. You have uh, React, you have Node, you have different things that you could use to create websites. Um, in fact, the most popular framework and libraries to use with React were actually created by Facebook. Um, they they created that library to help innovate just their user experience. Um, as far as like what I'm learning outside of that, because I have knowledge of that, Java is actually very close to Python um, in terms of just syntax stuff. Um, syntax would just be like grammar um, as far as like written English. So that's something that I'm starting to get more into because you know, kind of being a gamer, Minecraft's coded in Java, so that's fun to play around with. Um, but, a, but a lot of other companies do use Java for a back end. Um, so it is something new to learn. It's always good to reach out, branch out, and learn new uh, languages, learn new languages, learn new software, frameworks, libraries. Um, it's not something that you can just, you know, I've learned these two languages, I'm good, and I'll only look for these two languages to write in, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's really never the case. Um, sometimes people will sit in that, but those are the people that you'll get with a company. You'll never leave that company, thus you'll never use other languages other than necessarily what the company's using at the time. And a lot of big companies... Um, today, th there's been a big push for newer frameworks, newer software, but a lot of big companies do use a lot of older code. So the things I learned in Lambda, the uh, career techniques, the searching, the learning curves, and the learning techniques that I've learned um, would come into play just in the next career job I get to learn and adapt to what code they have. Yeah. That makes sense. 
So to begin learning those, it seems like a huge task in a way. You know, I've I've played some of those kids games to learn coding and, and then tried to move on to Code Academy. Um, but yeah, even that was quite difficult for me. And maybe it was because I was kind of doing it all alone and didn't really have any guidance with it. Um, I didn't really look up you know, YouTube videos or, or research things. But um, yeah, I guess what's, how much do you need to know to personally start coding, you know, in a really practical way? And I guess what are the steps to, you know, get into that? So when I started with um, what I said earlier, Team Treehouse, the language I started learning was Python. And Python and JavaScript are easier languages to get into. But when I was looking for the next school that I want to use, Lambda School, I really wanted to just forget what I had learned because I didn't, you know, I learned some things, but it wasn't like I really learned it and knew what was happening and going on. I wanted a base understanding. I wanted a school to be like, hey, I want to walk in completely dumb to everything and I want to go from ground zero, from ground like negative to, mm -hmm. you know, being able to understand what's happening. Um, so from that regard, um, what I would say is that, and especially going through Lambda and talking with different people from different walks of life, you know, I had team members that were 40, 60 years old and then other team members that were younger than me, 16, 18 kind of thing. Um, and everyone, everyone adapts differently to that type of mindset, but it is something to one, get used to. It's not natural um, necessarily to just be able to walk in and be like, oh, I just get it right away. You know, mm -hmm. those cases are really far and few between. Most people or most coders really have to work to get the understanding and gain that understanding um, about how to code. Um, it, so it really is the mindset and the determination to learn. Um, it's definitely the teachers that you have. Um, if I didn't have people to constantly ask questions or to, or to go back to, even the, um, yeah. sorry, there's just a little bit of background noise. Um, even the instructors, when they had their uh, live programming sessions, you know, they had times where the students could ask questions. And I definitely asked several hundred questions just about what's happening. Okay, but why? Okay, but why? Okay, but why? Um, so determination, que uh, always questioning, like what's going on and having the instructors to question that or having the people to properly teach you and yeah. then just the initiative to go out and search go out and google um, a lot of things you can actually learn and i use a lot of stuff on youtube as far as like my research you know i follow some uh, some coding channels where they do updates on different things every other week or so um, but even like go and code how to code the game snake right Some, something pretty simple you can have one or two videos you could have the one guy that sits there and just codes it out and just tells you okay this does this this this, this and it should work and then you have the other video that's like a several part series that says this is what it does and why so knowing which one holds more value to learn and just trying to find and seek after that yeah i would say from a very ground level, anyone could learn how to code. When you really get into it, it's a lot like um, basic logic and English. You know, I want the computer to say, take my login and my password, my username and my password, and let me through to the website. You write logic that does exactly that. It's, it's very, um, at a top level, it can seem very simple, and sometimes it really is. There are other times when you get into more of the back-end side where it's more algorithms and 
concepts and theorizing that you're doing. Um, the back end has a lot of concepts that you work with as far as data tables, things you don't necessarily see. You go to, you know, another website, build up a mock for the database and then try to visualize that with your team. Um, so it will go as deep as you want it to go um, because it can get very conceptual, right? You know, there's a very high level where anyone can really learn this stuff. If you have the determination, if you have the right environment set up, and if you have um, the resources available to you to do so. Um, and really that will go as deep as you want it to go. So you can do just basic front end stuff where it's like, I want the background to be purple. I want the background to be pink. And then I want my login to look pretty. And you can go into the more heavy concept stuffs of the back end and just be like, I want this table to do this and this and that and that and this. And I probably use terms um, a lot now and in different languages that isn't uh, that isn't necessarily common. So I could say something like node and not a lot of general people would know what I mean by that. Um, so I would say this and this did occur with uh, almost all of my instructors going through Lambda is they had a higher understanding or a, a deep level understanding as it were of coding software development the whole process right they had this deep level understanding it was hard for them to sometimes address the people at the top level that are really kind of lost in trying to dig into that yeah. um, and so I feel the the more you really get into it, sometimes the harder it can be to explain to um, people that maybe don't understand when it when it clicks for you, it doesn't necessarily click for someone else. Um, it's sometimes harder to explain that to other people. Right. Yeah, I mean that makes that makes total sense. I mean that's how a lot of different skills are in a way, but. Yeah, this it's just such an interesting area to me because <laughs> I mean part of the incentive is the practical aspect of it. You can literally create something out of almost nothing. It seems so magical in a way, you know? Mm -hmm. It's 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 quite tangible in on the creation side. Um so I guess in that area, what what type of things have you created or what projects have you worked on um you know those kind of out well have you done any outside of school specific yep. projects or mm -hmm. yeah what's been your like favorite ones um well my favorite one just because of the experiences i got for it and the company i was working with and the team that i'm still friends with to this day we've been friends for almost a year now from when we worked on the project was um Ooh, excuse me. was my labs team with Miracle Messages. Um, after you go through uh, the full stack web development course with Lambda, you're, you then go into what's called Lambda Labs, and that's when you have projects that you would work on with other team members or other students for several months. And a lot of outside companies would reach out to Lambda and say, hey, we have projects, can we use your students to help kind of get these projects off the ground and uh, spearhead and start these things? And so one of the companies that outreach that I applied to work for and ended up getting was Miracle Messages. Um, Miracle Messages is a Christian outreach company that focuses on um, reconnecting uh, the homeless or unfortunate with past family and loved ones. Um, a lot of people kind of down on their luck, just out in different states, out in different areas, you know, hundreds of miles away from family or relatives that may not even know what happened to their family member, may not be in a position to be able to go out there and search or just, you know, they've fallen off. And they would go and connect with them and say, hey, would you like to know uh, where your family is and would you like us to give them a message for you and there's been hundreds of different connections that have come from that and a lot of them 
and in actual housing and caretaking for the homeless person. Like, hey, we finally got in touch with my, you know, this family and they didn't know I was homeless and they, they want to offer me a place to stay, you know, instead of living on the street. So it, it was something that was really fun to work with. Um, the project up and coming was just kind of a, uh, a chapters page to show you like these are different areas that are connected that are groups of miracle messages all across the US. So me and my team worked on that. Um, and there's, there's another team currently working on it, but that was a lot of fun to go through. Especially because uh, we were actually down more than half of our team uh, when it came to it. We had about 16 different people that were on this project. Um, project managers, UI developers, front end, back end, a whole slew of different uh, devs. And right before everything started, um, I think we started working in late August, September, right before like the project actually really begun, day one hit, more than half of them had family issues came up, people were chronically ill, just a lot of, lot of unforeseen tragedies happened to more than half of the team. And so it was left to um, was it me, Rowan, Shelby, Noah, um, me, me, down to seven, six of us, yeah. Yeah, it was really just down to six of us at the end of the day. Um, so several months with just six of us going like, hey, what do we do? Um, you know, there was this project that we were in constant talks with the CEO with, um, and it was me and another um, another student from Lambda that took charge to go, all right, well, let's break it down. What do we want? How are we doing these things? What are we doing with this? And of course, the actual Lambda staff came in from time to time to help and be like, do you have any questions? Is there anything we can help with getting done and off the ground? Because this is like an legit company that is trying to get something um, off the ground. So it was really fun to yeah. work with them, talk with Kevin, the CEO, hear his wants and dreams with, um, with just bringing their page to more people, getting it to be more accessible to more people so more people could join. Um, it was just really fun. Yeah, it's cool. It's really practical, impacts people's lives. Um, and, and maybe that's where we start with the connections is just the responsibility really with with uh, programming and coding because, you know, it. I mean, every single art or uh, type of work is this aspect of being made in the image of God. We are creators. And I think coding is is like that. You know, it goes from nothing practically to making something really big and that really impacts people's lives. And it's almost like a new life in a way. Um, but obviously with that comes a lot. I mean, it depends on the heart behind it um yeah what do you think about just just the power of it and and the heart you need to have behind it um to really reflect that image of god in creating i would i would compare that to almost like writing a book there's a knowledge there that you have but it's the intent behind it on what you want the words to say what is the message of the book you're writing? Um, when you get into the biblical portion of coding, what is it you're doing? A lot of it is not a lot. A lot of this being a modern day kind of creation um, does not have a lot of biblical roots behind its original intention. But that doesn't mean you can't use this for the better. Apps are being used to connect people to God. Of course, the Bible app, it's all code. Churches need websites, places that people can go to to outreach, like church.com or the QNection app. 
Um, it's an app that my church came up with that's just a fun questioning app to get to know another person, like questions you might want to ask someone or icebreakers you don't know what to say with, you know, a conversation that might come up. Um, so as far as the intention behind it, it's a lot like writing a book where you have the knowledge, you don't necessarily know everything that's going to be on the page, and the more you write, the more... Uh, the more you think of to write, um, it's a lot like that. The more you start coding, the more an app or a, um, a project will develop, the more you think upon it, sit upon it. Oh, excuse me. Um, the more it grows and definitely with what I was working with Miracle Messages, I wanted to be able to help outreach in the digital era. Um, just more of where the world seems to be moving you know we're called to be in the world not of it but where the world seems to be moving i feel it's also important for the church to adapt in some respects to what's happening and chase after those people in the world to help show them that there's more to life than what is originally seen um, of course, that's a case by case basis, but especially with this digital revolution with, you know, the Internet exploding over the last 15, 10, uh, 10 to 15 years um, and just everything now really being digital and online, just wanting to charge in that direction and chase after people and that to say, hey, church sites are more acceptable are more um, accessible to the general public. They're easier to find. Um, you know, points of views, even some that uh, I wouldn't agree with, or, or not that I would agree with everything, but like the fact that they're available there for people to find very easily is very important. Um, just very quick to get the attention so people don't get lost in everything else that's on the internet or they have um, digital ways to communicate so like missionaries having backdoor ways to communicate to other churches when they're in areas that aren't supported or where they're uh, where Christianity isn't supported and in fact it's like hunted um, that's very important because I know some people in uh, situations like that and it's very important to have those types of accessibilities and those ways of communication to help outreach. Do you feel like the church has been kind of on the, or behind on this? Or do you feel like a lot of the church has kind of stepped up with um, using technology well? Um, from my own experience, what I have seen personally, I feel overall they've been a little behind on this, that it was more before before corona hit it was more of a um you know we have it and it's there it wasn't necessarily um a spearhead i did see a few churches try to try and really capitalize on the digital thing and they're they're benefiting now because a lot of things are online um but i feel as an overall you know when you think when you go as the general mentality the world has of a church you go oh you know just religious people going to a synagogue or a building or something you know the mindset's not out there for the world or it's not commonly referred to when we talk about um the judaic christian worldview of the church as being the people that's around there not necessarily the place and so when they think of a church they just think of the building when what you could do or what you could lead into that as far as spearheading is you could have it be almost more leaned in onto the digital side to say hey well that church has a neat website and then their message on what they believe is right there it could either hook people or draw people away but um overall i feel now since everything's been online there's been more of a realization in the church being like oh we really should outreach and really should um, do this whole digital thing, spearhead on uh, digital media and digital outreaching. Um, I've definitely seen some churches that even though it's hit, they've not done anything online and they've just completely shut down. 
and that's just impacted a lot of different people. Um, my my church personally didn't shut down until it was mandated, and then at that they immediately were online doing uh, podcasts and streaming it on YouTube. So that was that was good to have. Like mm -hmm. the ability to still attend church at home was something really good to have. And even now, um, it's more like you have to sign up online for attendance to be able to go because now they have more sittings at shorter services, but it's still right. all online. It's still all accessible. Right. So <clears throat> this kind of gets into the dangers of it, though, because technology is not a neutral thing it changes you whether for the good or for bad you know and and a lot of it's how you how our own hearts handle it so part of the danger i see and and i'm big on technology in a lot of different ways obviously you know we're having this conversation i'm put on youtube and everything but um I think the church also has something to say um, about, about the theological side of it. So, for example, the aspect that we are embodied people, you know, there's a distinction between when we gather as a body in the flesh, there's, there's a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, some people... When you when you're talking over Zoom or something, you feel there's something missing. It just feels too ghost-like, mm -hmm. you know. And 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 I think that goes back to who Christ is, because Him coming, though being Spirit, being God, um, He took on human flesh, and this aspect where He um, was an embodied person, He was in the flesh that was significant for our salvation and so there's this aspect where when the church gathers um in the flesh that's that's significant there's something distinct about that versus um only relating like if you if you break it down to only relating online i think you'd see effects and maybe people wouldn't know why but I think it goes back to that, is that we are, what's essential to humanity is uh, like gathering together as a church in, in the flesh, because Christ came in the flesh, and this is his body on earth. Um, that doesn't separate us, that doesn't cut off the possibility of uh, meeting together technologically, like online. Or the connection thereof, yeah. Yeah, uh, but but it shouldn't it shouldn't they shouldn't go against each other. You know, they should it should be used to connect online, but also have the embodied aspect because of who Christ is. I mean, part of communion, for example, is is looking around like First Corinthians talks about. When you take communion, you're you're uh, one as a body, and so if you can't look around and discern each other and see that you're one in Christ, then that's not truly communion. If you can't go to someone and say, "I've sinned against you," you know, will you forgive me? Mm. Um, like the purpose of communion is to see that we're one, one people, one body under Christ. And if you can't do that, then maybe something's being pulled apart from embodied communion. Uh, maybe you're actually pulling the meaning apart from communion by uh, bringing it into the technological realm only, limiting it to that. And I think obviously there's there's these situations that come up like COVID that are not in the ordinary, you know, mm -hmm. and that you can allow for certain things. But um, I think it, with, at, with all the ability 
we have to meet in person, I think we should we should go for that as much as possible because of who Christ is, being that he came embodied. Um, and there's a significance to that. What do you think about that? Well, I would definitely agree that there's a point of view that comes across, going back to the first point made on um, technology being neutral in one way or another. I would agree that it does change you and just because how much it shaped our today culture and on the point of Corona itself and what we find ourselves in, we find ourselves in a point in Earth's history, in human history that we've not experienced before. The ability to be so contained and separated yet still have the ability to outreach and in a sense, connect with other people like how we're doing this over um, Skype and just connecting with each other through, you know, all the way across the world. Um, yeah, especially with um, in the past with uh, the Bible study, just people wanting to make it more Zoom meetings because it's they don't want to go out or they don't want to. Um, risk certain things for their own standards you know that's everyone's personal choice to do that i've definitely noticed the lack of communication or not necessarily communication but connection the lack of connection and intimacy there is with other people when you're able to talk about deep theological or philosophical things or even just scripture in general or even just hey how was your day you yeah. know it's, it's different on the phone than it is in person. Um, and I would say the biggest challenge that we have coming up is the world now realizing how easy it is to connect, you know, like this and stay disconnected right. and have a push for that instead of actual connections you know in california if you haven't heard they're trying to shut down churches but they're keeping casinos open at 50 percent capacity things like that um the world deeming what's important and not and if it realizes that separation and connection online is a good substitute for in-person connections then that's something we could see uh, the church having to fight off in the future and as far as the actual personal connections, I believe that's because when we were created in the image of God, God is a very personal being. He wants a personal relationship with us, an intimate relationship with us, a romantic relationship with us. Romantic in the sense that he loves us. He, he adores us. He wants to chase after us. When Jesus was describing um, what the Father is like, and he was talking about the, the father and the two sons, the one, two sons of inheritance, the one that went and squandered it and then coming back trying to uh, be the father's slave. The father ran out to him in the middle of the street, dropped what he was doing and ran out to him. You know, in the, cult, in the culture and time that Jesus was explaining that message, it's unheard of for a father in that situation to do what he did. It's so impactful for that culture to hear that type of story, to know the father of the household ran after his son, stopped what he was doing, ran after his son, hugged him and clothed him and brought him in and threw a feast for his returning. That's the love that God has for us, the intimate, romantic, passionate love for us. And I think because he's created us in his image, we have that connection and it's amplified through um, our salvation with Jesus Christ and our walk with the Holy Spirit and him that when we're together and when we when we're around other people there is that spiritual connection as well as a physical connection that's made there an emotional connection that we can all rely upon each other for we have support with each other we have support as uh, emotional support, spiritual support, physical support for each other. There's a sense of security that comes with that. It's why a wife loves being secure with her husband when she's around him because that makes her secure because he's there. Um, I mean, having a long distance relationship, it's 
it's so much different the over the phone or in Skype and then the in person. One of my uh, mine and Sky's main love languages changed to quality time because we love time that we would spend together, even though we would talk every day. We were a longer distance relationship for two years. We would talk every day. We valued the in-person time more together than we did necessarily the separated time over uh, Skype or Zoom calls or texting. Um, so there is something that is lost with, uh, there is different types of connections that are lost or you're not able to go in as deep with Zoom calls or uh, Skype calls or meetings or emails or stuff like that. So. Yeah, well, I think and I think there's that aspect where technology kind of teaches this Gnosticism where it separates the body from the spirit, you know, and only elevates the spiritual things. And that's almost how technology is, you know, it's almost this spiritual disembodied thing. And that's kind of sometimes over esteemed. Um, and you get that with like pornography, for example, it's this disembodied sexual thing that, that isn't real sexuality because it's not embodied. Like real sexuality is, is meant to be embodied. And so, you know, I think that kind of goes into so many different realms, but, but you can also have it in communion as well. Um, if it's disembodied, it loses its meaning as well. And so actually all these embodied truths, like the significance of it, goes back to Christ, that he, he came and took on flesh for us and for our salvation, so that he redeemed humanity. He redeemed the body. The body is good. Um, it's not something to get rid of and kind of portray this, I don't know, person you want to online that's not truly your person. Um, it's kind of this spirit Gnostic person you've created, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of some aspects of of I think some dangers that maybe people don't see and they, and they have really deep theological roots to those. Um, I think we feel the effects and consequences sometimes, but don't realize what it goes back to and why. Um, and I think probably the other most significant one I've seen is uh, the promise technology gives to become like God. And you have this in tons of different areas. You know, you have it in transhumanism, um, you know, writing code to make something that you can put in yourself. Um, you know, I listened to the Joe Rogan, Elon Musk podcast where he's just talking about putting this thing in your mind and we could talk to each other without using words and stuff. You know, this and this aspect of like living forever. There's the website called eterni.me that offers virtual immortality and, you know, tracks all your data and everything so that you can uh, kind of, once you die, live on online. And so there's all these promises of like eternal life, um, promise to be omniscient, you know, through the all-knowing Google, promise to be omnipresent through like always there with texts and emails. Um, and omnipotent through like innovation, you know, Microsoft's kind of big thing is like AI empowers us. But sometimes I've seen those things as you're almost empowered to be enslaved. Um, it, it's almost, we can't bear being like God in this way. We can't bear being always on our phone, texting people or emailing people. That's, that's not what we can do. But God, he doesn't miss any prayers. You know, that's something he alone can bear. And it's almost this thing being foisted on through technology to be like God. Um, 
and I think there are promises that that technology can't fulfill, but can, but will kind of only lead to our destruction ultimately. Uh, say, I have a, um, or I'd like to mention on that that I feel it could also decentivize. Um, people to go on and do that they thought of well i know everything because i have google right mm -hmm. so why should i look up anything right. or the thought of i want to um like i was like i was saying earlier there's only so far a connection could go just verbally like this and i mean that's all it is i'm just seeing a picture there's not a body there there's just my voice coming across through the other screen your voice in my ears um, there's only so far you can go with an actual human connection and it's so easy to just go, Hey, well, let's just zoom and I'll just be in my bed and I don't right. have to get up or get dressed or do anything. Um, just the dangers that come with that as well. I feel a lot of people that could be drawn into a church, right? You know, going online is one thing and it's great to have the accessibility to have that have those resources available to the public but for people that only love surface level you can't love deeper unless you understand where love comes from you have the appreciation of what true love really is you can't love harder you can't love stronger you can't love deeper human based love cannot overcome anything god's love can God's love can work through us so we can love others more. But you can't get that deeper connection if the only thing you're trying to connect to is a flat screen and voices. Mm -hmm. At that point, you're trying to determine what voices to hear and you're not in person to see or hear or experience the other things that humans register as recon recognizing something, the emotion behind something, this the room emotion, the spiritual connection behind that. Not saying you can't necessarily get that online or watching a sermon, because there are definitely sermons I've watched that move me, especially when listening to people like the late Ravi Zacharias. But there's a difference in actually being there, being in a room with people who may or may not share your same values, but are there to learn and are there to invest and at least hear what God has to say to us. Um, there's just a deeper connection that we're not able to create because of that. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like our whole value has been shifted to efficiency. You know, like, oh, I can sit in bed um, because that's easier for me. It's more convenient for me. Um, but there's, but there is a lot of value to going, like making the effort, going somewhere in person and having to sit there instead of just swipe or like X, I'm done watching that. Um, this guy, uh, Wes Avram, he says, the instant response becomes the most valuable response. And so educators become choreographers of immediacy rather than midwives of slower wisdom. Mm. I just think that's so true. Um, like how wisdom is got is, is so different through the means of technology. Um, if you, if you kind of give into that specific way of getting wisdom, you know, instead of like life trial type things and, and working things out, over time and that building slowly instead of getting it all quickly at once um, that can quite puff you up and um so yeah it's almost like values shift quite a bit to efficiency and i think that is quite limiting and dangerous at times um with the yeah, ease think, of technology yeah, yeah. does come a lot of, sorry, did I freeze up? Nope. Okay. Um, with the ease of technology does come a lot of shortcomings thereof. The incentivize to be lazier because things have gotten 
more efficient. I was just thinking, you know, what would, uh, based on what you said earlier, what would happen if we just got rid of technology in today's standard? Would the human race survive? The answer is yes, we survive. We have, you know, up until this point. Um, it's just a lot of things have become easier and thus the the avenues for certain mentalities or mindsets that aren't necessarily the healthiest have become more um, more accessible. So I would agree that I, you know, staying in bed, not that there is necessarily at face value anything wrong with, you know, if you're sick one day or if you just, you're not able to make it and go to church, you can sit there and watch it in your bed. I've done it once or twice when, you know, I didn't, I wasn't able to sign up in time to go to church. So I was like, okay, well, I just, I got to watch it at home. Um, but still the incentive to go there, make that connection is so much more rewarding, but there's more behind it than just what's actually happening at that time. What you're doing is you're setting a precedent to continue the work that Jesus had for us which is to connect with others, to show up, to be present. You can't connect to others if you're not present, if you're not there. Not to say you can't connect online, but again, going back to you can only connect so far over a screen. There's a difference in emotional reading that I could get from uh, us sitting in a room and talking about this thing than just right here on the other side of the screen. I'm having to guess your emotions and guess your um, your uh, your thought process based on what I'm seeing on screen. Whereas in the room, you can feel a room, you can feel the atmosphere, you can emotionally connect with people, and the topics can become more deeper and more intentional because of that. Um, yeah. Just that type of incentive to make things more efficient so you have to do less does right. kind of work against what the Bible says is you will work every day by the sweat of your brow. You know, sunrise, sunset, you got to be working. Um, yeah. Not to say there aren't breaks or aren't ways to make efficiency good. You know, efficiency isn't necessarily bad, but it can, right. especially digitally, lead to um, unhealthy avenues or leave open unhealthy avenues that are now more accessible because things seem to be getting so much more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously all of this is, is to show there are dangers in it. You know, like efficiency is really good. And it's what we're, I mean, a lot of the things we're talking about is built on technology. You know, we can't condemn it completely and be doing this and even live, right. honestly, because it's so built into our lives. And so but right, there like are my, my career is based on technology right now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, so we we obviously don't condemn it. Um, we just at least point the church has to point out the dangers of it. Because it goes back to our heart, how our heart responds to what we've been given technologically. So if we're given this efficiency, how do we use that well to the glory of God? Um, like what you're saying, there's an aspect where it's limited. You know, um, you can't love people in person, embodied. Um, and that goes back to Christ again. You know, like he came in the flesh, loved in the flesh and told people, this is my command, love one another. If he was a spirit, just a spirit like this Gnostic type thinking, mm -hmm. then we'd be like, well, that's impractical. You can love people and not suffer for it. You know, you can love people and it's, it's not hard for you. So why would we do that command? But the fact that he was embodied meant those nails, you know, on the cross, um, were excruciating pain to him. And so he loved us, you know, to that extent in an embodied way to which he suffered. And so, um, yeah, it goes back to his command of love one another 
has to, to some extent, be embodied. It, it can't just be limited to technologically. Like, you can love people technologically, but it's not solely limited to that. Um, so, yeah, a lot of it goes back to who Christ is, um, these main principles of, like, being made in the image of God we create, and, the, and this is good. Um, but then what do we use the creation for? Mm-hmm. You know, like Babel, for example, was the Tower of Babel was innovation and they had unity around it. But the heart, the motive was was evil. It was wrong. It was to be like God. It was to step on others so that the strongest, you know, rise to the top. Um, so that's what we have to watch, that danger amidst what we've been given that there there is a lot of responsibility to it um and we have to watch our hearts that we do it to the glory of god um be creators of good you know and not evil innovators of evil as romans 130 says so i think the other thing to be mindful of is and again this isn't just a knock on technology or the internet because obviously i'm a gamer my piano encodes technology my computers are technology my tv's technology you know a lot of what i do involves the technology chair. yeah my my chair technically the swivels technology um right we wouldn't have a lot of advantages we have now in life if yeah. if we didn't have these types of creations or inventions and personally i feel a lot of these things are answered prayers from long ago the ability to reach out to someone all the way across the world as we're doing right now that's you know a hundred years ago that was unthinkable unless it was by pigeon <laughs> throwing <laughs> that out um but i say that to say um the biggest thing to look out for when it comes to technology is what it's done in the past 10, 15 years and its mainstream is influence. What the influence is behind what the technology is and where it's going for. There are certain things and brands and uh, things that I like but the influence that they have or have had on me in the past can come a, can come across as more as an idolatry than it can an actual helpful learning experience or this is fun to watch or fun to uh, get involved with type of thing. It can become a heavy influence and I feel for a lot of people when you as humans we're looking for a constant influence that's why we have idols that's why we have that's why we worship certain things that's why we as christians point to god because that's the best influence not only for us but to be with us through that no other idol can do that and there are different promises that um, people company the internet in general can make that will uh temporarily fill that spot or that void in a person's life as far as what am i influenced by am i influenced by my favorite streamer my favorite youtuber my favorite website my favorite brand my favorite this that um a lot of it is i I kind of sound old school when I say this, and I don't mean to say it in necessarily this type of way, but the point is still there. A lot of it is the devil's side of it, where he says, okay, if your influence is not going to go through God, it's going to come through something else, because anything else is a perversion. Anything else. And that goes for everything, whether you're listening to a financial advisor, whether you're listening to um you know social media or uh political media if those not to say all influences are bad but if your main influence comes from something other than the lord you're going to be led down different avenues that are that will in turn destroy your career or your livelihood or your relationships 
or your marriage. You can't put God as a number two in your life and have your social media be number one or your political interest be number one. You can't have God as anything other than number one because then your number one dictates how you go through problems, how you deal with stress, how, what your outlets are, where you find your comfort, your peace, your rest, your joy, your fruits of the spirit, which only come from God. Right. So influence is really what I see personally as the biggest part because, you know, as a coder, I could go out and code whatever I wanted, but there are definitely things I don't want to code. There are things that I don't want to contribute to, sites that would ever contribute to pornography or um, I'll try to not get too political in this. <laughs> there, there, there are different types of the internet culture that I do not want to contribute to. I want to contribute to things that are positive, that are Christian based. I could work for a company that might not be Christian based, you know, like Google or Amazon or Facebook or something. Um, and that's just me getting a job, me working by. But as um, you know, the Romans said to Jesus, you know, I have other officials that I work for. And when I go back, um, when I go back, what do I do? And he says, just go back, work under, you know, you love the Lord, but go back and work under them and just do what you're supposed to be doing. Right? And there's kind of that mentality with it. Um, so influence is a really big part of this whole discussion and uh call it an argument per se just i know people would kind of argue against that like oh certain things aren't influential certain things are just for our benefit but that's, yeah. that's a whole other avenue well right i mean i think it goes back to this aspect that christians say is everyone's worshiping you know whether an atheist um whoever you are if it's it, it could be worshiping yourself but we all worship something we're all in awe of something and give ourselves to it in time, um, in our thoughts. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, a big part of it is, is a lot of big companies extract your data based on where you go online or whatever in order to market back to you, in order to conform you to their image so that you're essentially a walking billboard for them. And so these things you like and enjoy, you know, you you like them on Facebook or whatever, you, you buy them on Amazon, they're all connected to, you know, your data footprints online or whatever. And so then it's marketed back to you so that your steps are almost predestined to walk in this way, to love this brand, and it becomes part of your identity because within it, there's this worship. You esteem something in it. Um, that gives you some sense of value, that gives you some sense of promise that usually God gives. Um, and so it's like, who are you going to be conformed to? Are you going to be conformed to uh, the marketing schemes or activities, as they call it? Um, are they going to predestine your steps of like what your next click will be? Or is it going to be God? Is it going to be looking upon Christ as, as your only God? Is he going to conform you to his image? And humans, I mean, we're always trying to conform someone to our image, either for good or bad. And that's how we rule, right? So, like, if, if Microsoft is, has this big marketing uh, activity thing, they're trying to... Uh, conform people to some type of image that's the way to rule it's it's almost good to see online as like this real estate in a way or this whole land of ruling mm -hmm. um and so it kind of goes back to who who's gonna rule over you because someone will um who's well, gonna be your god if you want examples as far as like ruling over and dictating in a sense on how things how you should view things 
um, there's been several controversies in the last few years with different types of game sites and movie sites, at least in what I've seen in the circles that I'm knowledgeable in as far as game sites and movie sites that they try to push certain agendas or they try to push certain views on people some that i wouldn't personally agree with because i think they're anti-biblical but they try to physically shut down the any opposition that would come against it whether proper critic criti criti criticization can't say that word criticism. i'll just say criticism yeah whether proper criticism or um spamming of just mom mentality of going against that right but that's an example of those sites shutting down the opposition saying no this is what you should be thinking even though we're a site for free thinking mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's the whole aspect of the intolerant or the tolerant become intolerant to someone or something along the way but yeah so yeah obviously there's these dangers to look out for um but let's talk about kind of the really positive things for whatever time you have left um uh like how to practically serve the church you know because i was thinking i think you could do like vr evangelism training or something you know mm. have someone come up to you and and you try to talk talk to them about the gospel that might help people with confidence in sharing the gospel um yeah what do you what do you think are you know either ways that we've kind of talked about some that have already been introduced but ways that we could serve the church through technology so i'll kind of go back to some of my other points and i, I will comment on the vr one um so with Bible study, when I was talking about there's really only so far of a connection that can be made, the fact that there is a Bible study happening in general is still a positive. The fact yeah. that people are still willing to be there and show up. And um, this past Bible study, we met in my park down the street and uh, two of our members showed up over Zoom. Mm -hmm. You know, I had my phone on, four of us were there in person, and two of us were there in zoom so the fact that we were still even able to connect and involve with what's going on um that's a big positive that comes out of this type of uh media or this that comes out of this type of technology and use thereof is the involvement you have with a church or something um again making sure we hit home the point that you can only really get so connected, but you can still be involved with a church or have an understanding of what's going on just based on listening to their podcasts and reading up their blogs online and subscribing to whatever service you have on your own church's website. But um, also supporting that we're able to communicate, send out update letters from missionaries and pray for them and know what they're dealing with in the now so we have more people outreaching and praying for people and helping people with that um, there are forums where there's just support groups where it's anonymous people would go on and say hey i need prayer for something i need prayer for this and then they would just whoever would see that would pray for that person um, so there are definitely some big positives that come out of that community um, Again, a big one that the world as a whole tries to push in whatever view it comes out of, the end goal being community thereof is still important, um, especially because we are beings that need community. We need connection. We need involvement with, excuse me, we need involvement with each other. Um, so something like the... Uh, the VR training that would be interesting I would I would need to see like I don't know if I was go as far as VR though that'd be really interesting because there are ways you could do that um, mm -hmm. but just like talking to someone in person uh, mm -hmm. like a, um, I don't know what the name name are but like a coach in that um, do you know what name that would be? Uh, uh, 
evangelical yeah. coach or something. No, not, not even like evangelical, but like going out to say, "Hey, I want to practice talking to someone into Christ." What are some questions that some people would have? A coach like that. There's there's a name yeah. for it. I just can't quite remember it off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, just different ways that you can outreach. Uh, again, I I fall a little more on the line of technology itself is a little more neutral, but the intent behind it is really where you get its value and where its uh, its morals come from. So if I'm coming from a Judaic Christian worldview and a Christian standpoint of I have my morals based on what God tells me and what the Bible tells me, um, Bible being the word of God, then my views and my morals are going to come through my work and what I put up. If I want to create an app that that's a, um, I'll kind of use the example I did, I want to create uh, a new forum or an app or a platform where you can create an anonymous profile, say, hey, I want to find a good Bible study in this area, or hey, I need prayer for this, and you just put some vague details, and everyone else is able to see that and pray for it, and you have um, you have a yeah. meter or a bar or something that's kind of like a, a like bar that just shows someone viewed that someone is praying for you. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen those. Um, and that's, I mean, that's what coding does. And that's why the church needs coders, you know, is if there's these problems, you know, like, wow, there's so many people who have prayers. And so we need, we need more people to pray. What do we do? Well, let's create a forum, you know, where this can happen. Mm -hmm. And, and that's kind of something that you and I have talked about. You know, that like all oh, these Bible studies, sometimes Bible studies are so shallow or general. Um, the ones that are created that that I was thinking we could we can make them localized and personalized um, to a specific uh, demographic. Um, that way they can they can be deeper if people need them deeper or simple if people need them simple. Um, you know, it's kind of that, and that's something that coders can answer really, you know, if it's a, if it's a really beneficial thing for the church. Um, and that's, I, I feel like that's a good way for people to start to think is what, what are the problems in the church? And obviously like through prayer and reading the scriptures, think theologically. That's where you need pastors, theologians. That's where you need just reading the scriptures. But then kind of turn to these designers, these coders, where um, they're going to help build the, the answer to that problem, solve that problem. Um, I think to help kind you... Of think about... To help you explain that point, kind of the one I made, uh, one of the first points I made about the church being a little bit behind as far as technology, but starting now since COVID hit and the world is truly seeing the capabilities of the internet and the connection that can be made thereof. Um, coders are kind of the answer to helping the church be kept up and pursue the world and the not necessarily pursue the world, but the people they're in, um, the people that are in the world, the people that are lost, the people living in darkness, to help pursue them and keep them, keep the church in the forefront of people's minds, keep the church up, relevant. Um, relevancy is kind of a loaded term when talking about the gospel because God always is, God always was, he never changes. And so the God of old is the same God today. And I just feel there are different ways that we can bring the gospel, you know, yeah. through through us as a church, that we can bring the gospel to people that are in the forefront of how the world is changing, where it's at, and bring that to them and be like, hey, so this is an easy way since, you know, you have all these other apps, maybe have this app that sends you a notification of the verse of the day every day. So you get to wake up and that's the first thing you read is the verse of the day. Instead of yeah. having to uh, go through different uh, mm -hmm. apps or different uh, cycles to try to find something or a place to read, you could have things that 
send you that or you have places that encourage you because of that. Um, I just feel that's a really good way for and and this this type of position this these type of peoples my peoples <laughs> um, can help can help the church pursue the people in the world like that to where we can lead them back to the pastors and the preachers and the outreachers and the actual groups themselves. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I've I've heard of like you. The uh, U version Bible, um, how how it has like 380 million downloads, and you can do like Bible studies on it, interact interactive Bible studies where you put comments in, and you have this group who can answer, and you know this is simple stuff. Some people like, but I think it the church needs to start thinking creatively of how to. Um, build that, build that community that we can have online without limiting it to only online. And then, um, yeah, creatively reach out, learn how to proclaim the gospel to people um, in a way that has different different means through technology um, that doesn't take away from the gospel itself. You know, so we need we need both to collaborate, work together, um, and that's mm -hmm. both are doing like the work to the glory of God. You know, you as a coder, you're creating, you know, and that is glorifying God and reflecting His image. Um, so yeah, it it all goes back down to the heart. You know, why are you creating? What are you creating for? What are you coding for? Is it for power? Is it is it for pleasure? Um, or or is it to serve people or exploit them? You know, um, is it to control people or or liberate them? Um, and and I think you can really do that through coding. You can give some technology that brings people into a peaceful environment or a connecting environment or a, um, a wisdom, you know, filling type environment. Um, and that's awesome. You can create that. So, yeah, go do that work. <laughs> but, okay, what are, your, what are your last thoughts on coding and theology? Um, well, as I explained towards the beginning, the deeper you get into coding, it will go as deep as you want it to go. So I think the connections you could make um, are as deep as you would want to try to search search for that. Um, I think when I think of coding and theology, I think of um, you know the verse in Luke where Jesus describes. You know, mm -hmm. if I'm trying to remember it, if so, so many sparrows or crows are sold for this amount, how much more valuable are you, right, to the Father? He numbered the hairs on your head. You know, when the Bible talks about he knit you in his mother's womb, you think about a small section of our DNA that has encoded several billion bits of data into it just the intricacies of how we're made in regards to coding how you know coding's a language coding is languages that for our understanding speak to the computer on a very deep level and how the lord speaks to us that you know could be a general broad statement or um, what I always say about the Bible is one verse can be interpreted a billion different ways. It speaks to us on a deeper level, on our fundamentals of how we're created, how we perceive things, how we react to things, how we enjoy, love, experience things. Um, it's just really cool to think about. Cool is kind of like a hip turn. It's really cool to think about um, those types of connections. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think we need to as a church more and more. So, yeah, well, thank you, Madison. It's been awesome having this conversation. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I really enjoyed it and learning a lot about coding. I mean, yeah, I didn't know too much about it before. So, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Apologies for any type of uh, rambling. I tend to do that sometimes. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> no, it's, a, it's a conversation, you know? Yeah. So we all do that in conversations. And it's just how but it is. It's, it is fun because I enjoy talking about this stuff. Even when yeah. I get to ramble, that's the best. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. This is Coram Deo Conversations. Like and subscribe.